Mexico. A pesky pandemic and a global lockdown and businesses have been forced to transition to a work from home scenario just to maintain continuity. But while employees are presumably safe and sound working from home, that isn't always the case with business data and proprietary information nestled away on their laptops. Welcome to Keeping Virtual Work Environments Secure, a webinar brought to you by Bold Business. I'm Jim Genia, editor of Bold Business, and today we're very fortunate to have one of Bold Business's cybersecurity experts, master security consultant Stephen Weigelt, to talk with us and tackle what is perhaps uh, the biggest issue threatening businesses, cybersecurity at home. There will be a Q&A session uh, after the presentation, and there is a chat function uh, on Zoho. So if you have a question at any time, just put it into the chat, and I will read it off to Stephen at the end. And also, this uh, webinar will be available later this week on boldbusiness.com. Uh, so these cybersecurity security threats, where do they stem from? Next slide. Uh, these cybersecurity threats are often the result of um, a lack of the same safeguards that you find in the office. Um, these safeguards don't exist at home, leading to exploitable weaknesses and vulnerabilities. Also, many businesses are unaware of these risks. In addition, employees are likely unaware as well. Uh, who is Bold Business? Bold Business is a leading cybersecurity technology and training services company. Uh, we leverage an executive team with 25 years of experience, and we have a track record of success with global clients in telecom, healthcare, and more. In addition, our security team has a wealth of certificates. Uh, as I mentioned, Stephen Wagelt is a master security consultant. He's got over a decade of experience uh, in risk compliance uh, security architecture. He's a certified ethical hacker, and he's provided security architecture guidance, performed compliance ass assessments, uh, and built and trained security programs and teams. He's got experience in both the public and private sector, uh, working in insurance, finance, healthcare, supply, um, a whole list of, of sectors. So Stephen, tell us about the perils of working from home. Thank you, Jim. So, so a lot of things that we're used to by, you know, prior to this whole, you know, new norm that we're now experiencing, right? If everybody working from home, working remote, is we're always used to being in the office, going to a controlled environment, the same thing every day, right? We have our desk, we have our devices, we have our structure, everything is in place. It's, used, it's what we're used to following. So now we've all transitioned into this whole, you know, work from home, not just from a physical standpoint, but this mentality that we have. And there's a lot of variables that get introduced with that, right? So, so for starters, it's really difficult to, to maintain a separation between work life and personal life, right? Whether that be how you use your devices, how you use your time, how you control the information that you have in front of you, stuff like that, right? So, so things like, um, what you use your work devices for. It's easier to potentially use them for personal because you're at home in your comfort. Um, things such as device sprawl, right? Are your, are your devices, like so when you're in the office, your laptop or your desktop is always at your desk. When you're at home, probably not, right? They're floating around, maybe sitting on the kitchen because you went to make a sandwich or they're sitting on the couch because you decided to take a conference call while watching TV. It's up to you if you want to tell your boss that one. Um, Things such as shared workspaces, you're you're forced to share your office with somebody else um, that you know may or may not be somebody that should be listening to the information that you're sharing while you're on conference calls with clients, um, dealing with customer information. Your home Wi-Fi is not as secure as you would in an enterprise, um, so you have the the potential of attackers being able to come in that way. Plus, lack of IT support, right? So, what do you do if you have a problem when you're in the office? You have a problem, you yell down the hall, somebody comes and helps you out. When you're at home, you're kind of on your own. So what are we going to cover today? So there's many different ways to attack the challenges and the different variables that are introduced with us in this you know, new work from home environment. Um, I think we can, we can group them into some pretty big categories. One is some, some potential tools that we can leverage um, to help control things from a technical aspect to mitigate some of these threats. Um, how our network is configured at home, 
but as well as on the corporate side of how we're connecting back in, right? Making sure it's secured and has full availability for, for the connections and the influx of bandwidth that's required. Um, educating our users. So through security awareness training, that is really important from the standpoint of making sure users are aware of, you know, what's changed as well as making sure that they're, they're comprehensive of potential attacks coming in because of this new vulnerable um, environment that we're in. We'll cover um, policies and procedures, how you can set things in force for your clients um, as well as for your employees, right? So while they're at home, they have structure, they have things to follow. So they know the directions that they need to go and you know order of operations to maintain um, business continuity. Um, intellectual property gets overlooked a lot, right? That's the stuff that's usually in the vault while you're at work and has the most secured um, nature to it. Well, now we're at home, we've got to be able to protect that, right? That could be client information, your client database. That could be trade secrets on the new upcoming product you're going to release, um, blueprints or, or things like that. So just different things we have to keep in mind, um, but we'll, we'll cover these and, and ways that we can protect them as we go. You mentioned tools. What do you mean by tools and what are the risks involved with them? Well, so so tools from, from a standpoint of like I said, we can implement them from a technical standpoint. These are these are things that are going to allow us to control the workflow and continue with the business continuity, right? So so in essence, we are forced to adapt to a new way of doing business, a new way of managing data, managing connections, managing users. So so having tools in place to to ensure that that doesn't get interrupted is key, right? So we have to keep business rolling. Um, things such as um, controlled workflow, right? We've got to be able to control the data that the users are, um, and by users, I mean um, the employees at home, how they're managing it, how they're not just from a standpoint of how it's being distributed, whether it's through secure channels, um, making sure it's only going into the hands of the people that should have it, um, managing how it's stored, right? So is it is it locked down? Is it encrypted? Is it protected, right? So this, again, this is new stuff that you know, we take for granted while we're in the office. Now we're at home, we, we may not always, you know, keep these things in mind because we're used to somebody else doing it for us. Um, as well as activity tracking, right? So so this isn't so much big brother, right? Always knowing what you're doing, but it's more of a, an extra safeguard to to monitor what, what users are doing, what, what our employees are doing while they're at home, just from the standpoint of making sure that they're not going to malicious sites, making sure that, you know, sensitive company data isn't being uploaded onto the dark web for, um, for competitors to be able to access or um, be able to leverage that information for future attacks. You've laid out the risks. What are some solutions? So I think one of the biggest things that that can that can help with all this right is and it, it's something that hopefully you know we've been able to plan ahead of um, and always have this into our business continuity plan is is what happens if we can no longer come into the office right that's where business continuity comes into play um, a lot of times when it's um, a corporation if you know disaster hits and all of a sudden we have to enforce business continuity there's a plan in place there's another building we can go to we can all report to but right now we're sprawled everywhere um, I think one of the best things that we can do is as corporate issue devices, right? So, so don't just allow users to, you know, hey, now you're at home. Just, yeah, use your tablet, use your own computer at home and do your work information, right? So now you're, you're basically, you're allowing users to use devices that you don't manage, that you don't own, that you have no privy into, right? So you don't know what software is on there, who has access to it, what kind of controls. So users can potentially, you know, their users aren't as protected as they would be if they had a company issued devices that had a gold image on it that was a fully vetted security build. Um, we need to make sure that we're we're managing the file storage, right? Just because you're at home doesn't mean you do not you don't need access to those files that you would if you were in the office, right? So so that could be from a standpoint of digital files, but as well as physical papers that you know we may have, right? Of printouts and stuff like that. So we need to make sure that that stuff is still locked in and and stored, but still have the ability to be able to support to be accessed so we can continue our work. Um, software is key. Um, that, that's a really big point. If a user goes home and they don't have what they need to do their job, they're going to find a way to do it, right? So if you were not providing them 
with the approved software to do their job, whether it's, you know, Microsoft Office products or Google products or um, the proprietary software for architectural design and, and whatever it may be, right? A user is going to go on the internet and they're going to surf and they're going to find their own versions of these software. Now, the, the challenge with that is it's not vetted by your security team, your IT department is unsupported. It may ask for a credit card to get a license and it may not even be legit software, right? So that opens up additional potential attack vectors um, for users to be able to um, allow, you know, bad information and bad connections into it, right? VPN is also something that's important. Um, we need to be able to have that way to connect back into the office, but it needs to be secure. Um, we need to make sure that, that, so through setting up a VPN, if that allows us to have our users while they're at home, still simulate and create that environment as if they're physically sitting on the network in the office. So we're able to lock down and control it from a security standpoint, monitor the data flow, control that, as well as make sure that it's a secure tunnel so that as users are passing information and data back and forth, it's not intercepted. What's a VPN and what happens if it's not set up correctly? So, so VPN stands for virtual private network. Um, and, and as explained, it's, it, it is just that, right? So it creates that private network. So instead of, um, you know, you're at a hotel, you're using the public Wi-Fi at the coffee shop, whatever it may be, you're on an exposed network that is shared by a lot of people, um, people you don't know that may not be set up securely. So creating that virtual private network, what that does is that creates your own network and connects you back into the office. So it's very well locked down, it's secured in transport. Um, so any data that you send in isn't falling on into malicious hands and isn't easily accept, uh, intercepted. And so if it's not set up, it's not configured correctly, what are the risks involved? So so not just with VPN, but with you know any kind of the, the network and, and things that users need to be able to connect in, right? You're, you're opening things up to to a lot of variables that that not just from a security standpoint, but from a business standpoint that are very detrimental to the way the business functions, the way the information is handled and distributed um, and the upkeep of you know our day to day jobs. Right. So if the network, if the infrastructure isn't supported correctly, isn't stood up and managed in, a, in the appropriate fashion for this, all of a sudden this influx of users connected from a remote standpoint, we're looking at things such as loss of productivity, um, data leakage, and you know it, it goes on, right? So from a loss of productivity standpoint, if users can't access their resources, if they can't connect to the systems that they need to for their customer databases, for, um, for call logs, whatever it may be, um, if, if the data isn't managed correctly, right? If we're not watching how the data is transposed um, and how it's transcribed, right? It's, it has the ability to leak out to our competitors. Um, it'll get into the wrong hands. It'll fall into um, malicious sites, whatever it may be, right? And there's there's definitely things that we can implement, um, and we'll we'll cover that in, in just a minute. Things that we can implement to help protect from this stuff, right? But but as I mentioned, with loss of productivity, also comes resource availability, right? If it, if all of your users who are now remote are trying to access this system, right? Might there be something as simple as a time tracking system or a ticketing system? or even the customer database that all of a sudden they need, need to access more so because they're at home than if they were in the office and they have their own local copies. If they can't access that, how are they expected to do their job, right? The other thing is now that we have all these users at remote um, that are working from home, they're connecting back into the bandwidth that you've had allocated um, in the office, right? So things such as that you've had in the office that have um, protected you know, bandwidth in the past, such as you know, QoS, or you know, difference in the way you route certain traffic, that no longer is in effect because users are needing to use that bandwidth just to connect in, just to be able to connect to the VPN that you have or the resources that you have on the um, on the back end. You've laid out the risks. What are some solutions to uh, manage these risks, mitigate these threats? So I think the biggest thing is, is awareness. Right? Is the more you know, the better. Right? What's that saying? Knowledge is power. Um, I think it's very important to constantly be reassessing um, and and managing the threats that you have in your environment, right? And how do you manage these threats if you don't know them, right? So that's the key: is be aware, have gap assessments done, have a security audit done, right? Whether it's a um, your annual penetration test or a quarterly vulnerability assessment 
or even just something that's managing your your patch management system to to see if everything's up to date and up to speed, right? How far back are you on your upkeep of your software and the systems, right? So that's definitely something that's important because once you can get that baseline of where you're at and understand, you know what you're driving towards and you know the things that you need to you need to prepare and you need to mitigate, right? So um, as we touched previously, a properly configured VPN. So, so a VPN is secure in its own nature, um, but one of the things that, that companies overlook is how they configure some of it, right? One of it being the um, the aspect of enabling split tunneling. So what split tunneling does um, is it allows, while a user is at home and they're, you know, they're connecting to corporate information, split tunneling allows that any personal information that they do, whether it's internet browsing, Facebook, social media, um, anything of that sort, or unspe- unspecified um, corporate connections, is passed through their own internet connection at home, right? So what that does is unfortunately leaves the corporate, you know, leaves us as, as the business, leaves us blind to the communication and the data that's transmitting through that, right? So that leaves a potential gap of, you know, allowing, you know, customer information to leak out, passwords, malicious sites to be navigated to. So um, split tunneling can be beneficial from the standpoint of it saves you a little bit of bandwidth um, in the office, but if it's not configured correctly, you're opening yourself up to more harm than you are good. Um, some of the other things, right? Have a proper inventory of the data, right? So you can't control it if you don't know what it is, right? So all of a sudden users need access to databases, file stores, things like that. You need to have a proper inventory so that you can properly allocate the access to it. Um, so we don't need you know, somebody in finance or somebody in IT help desk being able to access financial data. That's just not data they need to access. So we need to have that separation of duty. We need to be set up based off of least privilege. Um, so so that's good. And we have things locked down. We have password protection, stuff like that. But passwords are, are only as strong as, you know, as the attacker coming in. So things like two-factor authentication are key. Um, whether that's through a secure t- uh, token that the company has been issued, or that's done through um, a text message that they'll get with a one-time use password that they can they can put in to verify that it is them. It's just that extra step. We did cover data leakage, right? So so things such as um, data loss prevention is a is a kind of a technical solution that can be implemented. So what this does is it it sits in line with your network and it man it monitors for critical and sensitive files. So files that you've tagged as confidential or top secret. Um, it also monitors for patterns of the data that are going through. So it can be set up to monitor patterns that look like social security numbers, credit card numbers, um, passwords, or things like that, so that it, it'll it trigger an alert, but it'll also block it before it's able to leave the company and, uh, and go to a destination that it wasn't meant for. You've talked about hardware controls. You've talked about technology controls, but are hardware and technology really the weakest link in the uh, in the cybersecurity chain? So there's definitely a key importance in in doing what we can from a technical aspect of it. Um, again, whether it's from an infrastructure standpoint, um, based off of technical tools, or or just different things that we've put in place. But again, those are only as strong as the users that are using them, right? So so un- unfortunately, users are very susceptible, especially with um, with kind of the things that are going on right now, right? It's there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of doubt, right? So that whole FUD mentality. Um, so users are, are, are very are very vulnerable right now, and so it's very easy for them to be attacked. So, so things such as, um, you know, right now we've got malicious attackers that are leveraging um, the information that, that's happening. So whether it be through email phishing, social engineering attacks, stuff like that, right? So Right now, the biggest thing I think everybody's focused on, you know, obviously getting the economy back where it is, but it is survival. And one of that, one of the key factors with that is the whole stimulus checks that are coming out or have already gone out, right? So unfortunately, we've got some bad people, some malicious people that are using this as leverage. And I mean, I get probably five to 10 a week um, emails from the IRS, right? Sending me emails that, oh, you know, you want your stimulus check, please reply with your social security number and it'll get deposited right away or fill out this form and put your bank account information, your social security number, your, you know, your firstborn, whatever it may be. And, you know, we'll, we'll give you this, you know, your stimulus check immediately. So, 
So that that's the key thing is, again, users are vulnerable right now. And this is not anything new. Uh, right now, there's just a new topic that is being leveraged. Well, what do we need to do to get out in front of this? So, so as, as we talked about in the beginning, training and awareness, right? So it, it's, it's our it's our duty to make sure that our users have the tools they need to, to successfully do their jobs, right? And that's not just from the standpoint of, you know, they have a laptop, okay, they can do their job. They have a printer, they can print. It's, it's giving them everything that they need to be successful because that's our jobs, right? We need to set up our employees to be successful so that they can continue to do their job and, and you know, and flourish in that aspect. Um, that doesn't stop when it comes to security. Uh, users are busy doing their job. They're there. They're working the call center. They're working the help desk. They're um, processing orders and papers, whatever it may be that they're doing. They don't have the same time that, you know, people such as myself who sit and eat and live and breathe security, right? So I'm, I'm always in the know of it. I'm constantly doing research, making sure I'm aware so that I can be protected and, and help advise others so that they can be protected, right? So, so I think training and awareness is key, whether it be something such as a, a security nugget, right? So a short video clip that's going to provide some some key points, some key takeaways, some actionable items that the user can walk away with and feel more knowledgeable, right? So that if if a social engineering attack comes in, so if, if a user calls them and tries to elicit information from them, or they get a phishing email, right? Um, they know what to do. They know how to handle it because they're more aware of, hey, this exists. Here's some key things that I need to look for. Um, Beyond that, though, I think you need to make it actionable, um, make it real, right? So that's, that's what we have on here is simulate a real world attack, use exercises, use examples, um, set up a, um, a, a company or, or somebody to do a phishing campaign, right? So have emails that are malicious and meant to simulate an actual attack, come into your employees and see how they respond. This, this does two things. One, this will help gauge how effective your security awareness training is. But this will also provide users with an exact example of, hey, this is what it would look like if this was a real attack, right? So we can see how users are responding to that. And the biggest thing is, right, don't just train them once and forget it. Um, make sure this is done on a regular basis, consistency, right? So not just from when new hires come in, give them their security awareness training, lay things out for them, but make sure that it's reminded of them, whether it's quarterly, whether it's monthly, or at the bare minimum, please annually. Uh, but definitely more frequently keep them in the loop because these things these attacks are always evolving there's always something new different ways that different creative fashions that that things are coming in so consistency is key i've got a stat for you 63 percent of companies have employees who work from home yet almost 57 percent of them don't have remote work policies your thoughts so so it's kind of a scary stat in its own right um, but the, the thing of note here is this stat is done pre COVID pre pandemic, right? So, so if you look at this now in today's terms and you change that first, you know, that first statistic line, right? Nearly 63% of companies right now, we're probably looking at closer to 85 to 95% of companies have employees who are working remotely that has gone up significantly. Now, if you keep that same 57% do not have a remote work policy have not set up ways for their, their employees to know what to do and how to manage this um, from a policy, a procedure, an infrastructure standpoint, that number is even more important to focus on. Because now instead of 57% of those 63% of companies, now we're looking at 57% to that 85 to 95%. So it's a much more staggering number. Okay, so what should companies do? So, so as we as we alluded to, right, policies are, are key, right? So we we've talked about technical aspects of it. We've talked about um, you know training our users, making them aware. We've talked about making sure our infrastructure is set up and how to how to divide things and keep them separated. Um, one of the easiest ways to do that, though, is to having the correct policies and procedures in place, right? So these are the guidelines. These are the rules. These are the best practices that that companies um, and you know by default the employees are set to follow and they agree upon it so that if they have questions, it's not left up to, you know, their own thoughts of how should I handle this? It's already laid out. It's already been thought through. It's already been researched. Um, so there, there's different, there's different um, industries that require different levels here, right? So um, 
one of them being if you're in the um, finance, you know, division or industry, you, you're adhered to um, PCI or the payment card industry, right? If you're in healthcare, you've got HIPAA guidelines that you have to follow. So some of these are more stringent than others, um, but the majority of them all factor back into um, into specific policies, right? So so things such as uh, system and communication protection policies, acceptable use policies, access control policies, these things are key. This is what's going to help deter and coach users and the company, right, to set the specifics from the things that we had discussed earlier, right? Whether it's, you know, we covered, you know, for example, the acceptable use policy. Is it okay for a for an employee to utilize their work issued laptop and resources to surf the internet for gambling sites or to bid on their eBay stuff or use social media, right? So we lock that in through policies and procedures. Users better know how to handle these things, what to do. And again, when things like this come up and this, you know, this new norm that we're in the middle of here, we have something to reference back to. You've talked about tools, you've talked about networks, training and policies all to protect digital information. As a certified ethical hacker, you probably have some insight on how digital info is, is usually taken, right? Absolutely. Um, so it's not just, you know, threats are always out there from a security standpoint, not just from a cyber perspective, but even physical, right? Um, when you go into a crowd, is it easy to, you know, have your wallet stolen? Yeah. I mean, if the guy knows what he's doing, it, it's not hard. You'll never know. Um, have your purse stolen, what, whatever it may be. Have your credit card cloned. Things like that are always out there. Right now, we're focusing on the digital aspect and from a cyber perspective. Um, so how is that data managed? How are we controlling it, right? Um, so things such as users are working from home, they're taking files home, or they're, you know, they don't have the same network resources as they would in the office. So they're saving things on USB drives or, um, or external hard drives that may have previously been used for their own personal stuff, or that may belong to their kid for his, you know, movie and, you know, music collection. Well, now he's storing company sensitive data on there. How is that being managed, right? How are we controlling that? So things such as, you know, making sure that they're encrypted and that they're protected, right? Making sure that they don't fall in the wrong hands. Stuff like that is important. Um, making sure that the network is secured and locked in, right? So we need to make sure that, you know, we're not sending specific, you know, sensitive information through, um, you know, through unprotected wireless. So from a coffee shop or from, or from a standpoint of at home, you know, that, you know, Maybe you've given your neighbor your password once because they were over barbecuing and they wanted to use your Wi-Fi. Things like that. We need to make sure we're securing and protecting those. Access control, we've covered that, right? Who has access to that kind of stuff? Um, what are some ways to protect intellectual property? So some of the key things that we can do, um, again, it goes back to not just the training, um, but there's definitely some technical aspects and tools that we can put in, right? And and there's even some stuff that we we haven't covered yet, but these are some basic, some high levels, right? Antivirus, we need to make sure that, you know, we're monitoring for malicious files, malicious access to firewalls, right? Making sure communication is only happening in the direction that we want it to, right? Unauthorized connections aren't coming through. Um, secure storage, right? Is stuff encrypted? Is it protected? If it were to fall in the wrong hands, we need to make sure that the malicious person is not going to be able to use it. Um, secure terminals, right? So this is important, right? Are we, while we're in the office, we may have a policy that, you know, when you walk away from your desk, lock your computer. Well, that should still be followed at home. Um, yes, everybody's like, well, I can trust my family, right? But, you know, some people have a kid that's going to go in there and be like, ooh, look, a new fancy laptop. Let's see if I can play Minecraft. Um, so stuff like that is important. The other thing that can be leveraged that we didn't mention here, um, if we don't have the ability to, you know, issue um, specific company issued laptops and stuff like that is is what's called a um, a VDI, right? So a virtual desktop infrastructure that we can set up. This can allow users to use their own devices if they need to and connect into a virtual desktop that's sitting in the corporate data center. That's something that is protected, that is behind firewalls, that has the same security standards as all of the servers in there that's being protected. So they're able to you know, remote in there and simulate that they're working on a, on a machine that's in the office. Um, things such as disabling the, you know, the clipboard sharing. So, for example, if a user has to, you know, copy, you know, a line of code or a line of customer information, they're not able to paste it back onto their onto their personal machine 
because it's all controlled within that environment. Okay. Well, we're in the home stretch, so I'm going to summarize everything that you said so far in, in some short points. Uh, you suggested that we provide the right tools and software uh, for business continuity. You stress that you need a properly structured and secure network, or VPN. Uh, you also really stress the aggressive security awareness training and uh, that a company needs to establish uh, policies and procedures for remote working. And you laid out uh, some intellectual property protections. Uh, now is the time for some Q&A. And I have a couple questions. Uh, first one is, you went into great detail about the need for security assessments. How often uh, would you say those are needed? So, so again, it, some some companies are going to have to adhere to more stringent um, guidelines. Again, if you're part of HIPAA or PCI, stuff like that. Um, at a minimum, definitely do a vulnerability assessment or a vulnerability um, scan. Do that at least quarterly. Um, make that a habit. Have a rolling um kind of a, a mitigation plan in place, right? A vulnerability team that manages, a vulnerability management team that manages these vulnerabilities as they come in. That way you can check them off, get them patched, um, be prepared for the next scan to know always where you're at, where your threats are, right? So that's that's key to always be aware of. Um, from a penetration standpoint, always do those at least annually, um, but don't just focus on just external, right? As we mentioned before, um, weaknesses live everywhere. Uh, so we want to make sure that you're you're doing these things internally as well, not just the penetration test, but the vulnerability assessment. Scan your internal stuff as well. That's going to give you a lot more results um, and protect you from maybe an employee who's having a bad day, who's about to go rogue and wants to take down your systems, right? Let's be prepared for that. All right. Next question. Uh, is there a way to allow remote users to use their own devices and still keep them secure? So, so there are ways to, to do that. Um, and some companies are already doing that on their local networks, right? Um, we call that um, MDM or mobile device management. Um, so what that allows us to do is users can, you know, use their own tablets, use their own laptops, but when they connect in through the VPN or through, um, you know, through a secure tunnel, their device is locked down from the standpoint of, um, it, it has to meet certain criteria, certain signatures before it's allowed to connect, right? So, so the VPN will check that, you know, does it, are you running an updated antivirus? Do you have a firewall enabled? Do you have malicious software running? It'll check for these specific flags to allow that connection to come in to make sure it's safe before it does. So, so there's a little more overhead involved, um, but it is something that can be done because again, right now a company may not be prepared to dish out 500 laptops for all of a sudden all these remote users right so allowing that is a good happy medium as long as it's controlled correctly all right well that's it for the questions steven thank you for your time today um to everyone that's uh tuned in i want to say thank you as well um like i said before the presentation should be available on boldbusiness.com uh, later this week uh, also, some of the techniques and tips provided today are used by Bold Business to secure its workforce, and they're provided to our clients and partners for securing their workforces as well. So thanks to all who tuned in, especially our partners, and that's a wrap.